This is information on Laplace transforms, on the final value theorem, and also on partial fractions. So as we think about, uh, as we talk about Laplace transforms, they uh, were developed by uh, Laplace. He lived from 1749 to 1827. And uh, this is his statue here in uh, northern part of France. If you look at his statue, you may not notice this little figure down here. A lot of people feel like they get crushed by uh, the Laplace mathematics. Hopefully this presentation makes it a little bit easier. Okay, we want to talk about, first of all, initial value. Uh, initial value theorem is that uh, you take a signal, in this, in this case it's y of s, um, and the uh, initial value theorem is the uh, initial value, okay, is equal to uh, as you take the limit as s goes to infinity, um, you have to multiply s times y of s, and then you take the limit as s goes to infinity, and that'll give you your initial value. The final value theorem is that your final value for stable systems, it's only for stable systems, um, as s goes to zero of that same quantity. Okay, so this is our uh, final value theorem. And this is our initial value theorem. Okay, so when I think about S um, in Laplace domain, um, you know, it isn't a time variable, but I, it's almost like frequency or, or something like that is kind of like as the uh, frequency goes to, this one makes more sense to me, as the frequency kind of goes to zero, it's kind of like steady state. Um, <clears throat> then I get my infinity, what my value of y is going to be at infinity in the time domain. Okay, so this is my, my y value here. Um, and what I'll do to get the initial value is I'll multiply both sides by s and then take the limit as s goes to infinity. Okay, so um, in this case, uh, let's go ahead and just do this. S times S plus 2 over S plus 3 times S plus 4. Okay, then let me go ahead and divide by S everywhere. 1 over S on the top and the bottom. That's going to be um, 1 plus 2, 2 over S. Okay, and then I have... Um, Okay, so that is going to be S1. Let me do uh, S squared. Okay, just eliminate that first S. And then um, I'm going to have 1 plus 3 over S. And then 1 plus 4 over S. Okay, so the initial value theorem says that as S goes to infinity, that uh, the value of this, you know, all of these are going to go to 0. Okay, so I'm going to go to an initial value of 1. Okay, and here you can see, let me just erase all of this um, as I just worked it out. Um, okay, so we have that, you know, divide the top and bottom by S squared, and we got a value of 1. Okay, so final value theorem, same thing. Let's just multiply by S and then take the limit as S goes to zero, okay? And so in this case, um, I'm going to multiply uh, by this s, as I mentioned, and then just the limit as s goes to zero, it's going to give me a zero value. Okay, so this is going to go to six, one, and two, but that is going to go to zero, so zero multiplied by anything will be zero. Okay, so um, let's say we have complex factors, okay? So um, in this case, uh, we have an example problem uh, right here. And uh, we want to be able to say something about not just the initial value or the final value, but um, what it's going to do as it uh, gets to uh, what the response is going to look like. Okay, so uh, the basic rule is that, it, that we're going to analyze the roots of this. So we're going to set this equal to zero. And then we're going to find the roots of this. and then if they have an imaginary part, okay, so imaginary part, it means it's going to oscillate. Um, and no imaginary part um, on any of the roots, and it won't oscillate, or it'll be smooth. Okay, and then if you have a, uh, 
a positive uh, real root um, even one it's going to diverge and but if all are uh, negative real so the real part uh, even if you have a complex uh, root um, then it's going to uh, eventually converge to a value okay so that's what we can tell from the imaginary part of the roots and that's what we can tell from the real parts of the root okay so we can use the uh, we can use the quadratic formula in this case to be able to compute uh, the roots um, and uh, we do that calculation <clears throat> and we come up with uh, these roots right here s equals negative 2 minus j or i uh, and uh, negative 2 plus j or i for the imaginary part so we have um, negative uh, negative real so that means it's going to um, it's going to converge eventually converge and then we also have uh, imaginary um, so that means it is going to oscillate. Okay, so what that means is it, it might uh, come up to a value, oscillate, but then finally converge to a value. If we had a positive real root, we would expect it to oscillate, but go to like infinity or negative infinity. Okay, so um, complex roots indicate the oscillatory behavior, the sign of the real part. If it's negative, if all of them are negative, then convergence is expected. But if only one root has a real positive part, then we know that it's going to diverge. Okay, so it's kind of like a bad apple in the, in the batch. If Even if you have one, it means it's going to diverge. Um, so algebra is needed to invert um, the transforms uh, with complex roots, um, but it's going to be doable. Okay, so... Um, we need to split it up into different pieces. That's what we'll be talking about. Um, we're going to talk about uh, you know, being able to separate these uh, with partial fractions. Okay, but the important thing from this analysis is that you can just look at the roots and you can say something about it, like whether it's going to converge or not, um, and also whether it's going to oscillate. So that's an uh, important part of this. The roots are the, um, they're the, uh, denominator part of uh, a fraction. So let's say I had s plus 2, s minus 1. I could either go through the process of converting this back to the time domain, or I could just look at this and say I have a root that's equal to negative 2 and root that's equal to 1. Well, I don't have no, I have no imaginary part, so it's going to be smooth. Okay, and then I have a, a real positive root, so it's going to diverge. So immediately I know that this signal, because I'm looking at the roots of just the denominator, um, that it's going to be smooth, but also diverge. So it's probably going to look something like that. Okay, it'll go to infinity um, or negative infinity. Okay, so let's just practice with this one. Will um, Is this going to converge or diverge? And then also, why in the time domain is it smooth or is it oscillating? Okay, so we're just going to look at the roots of just the denominator. We don't need to look at the roots of the numerator, um, just the denominator. So we have one that's going to be, um, we'll, we'll just look at, at this one right here. Okay, you also have s equals uh, 0 as well. That's going to be... Um, this is going to be a step. Okay, so 1 over s, that is a, uh, a step function. Um, and uh, we'll just analyze this one right here to see if it's going to oscillate or not. Okay, so if we do the quadratic formula on this, okay, or we can compute, uh, complete the squares. There's two methods to do that. I personally prefer this one. It's a little um, easier for me. I just have a formula, negative b plus or minus uh, square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. You do that calculation and uh, you get that it's going to have an imaginary root, so it's going to oscillate, and uh, there are all uh, negative real parts, so it is going to converge. Okay, so inverting transforms with complex roots in the denominator. 
Um, you know, if you do need to get back to the time domain, there's a couple different ways to do this. You can use an expansion without using complex numbers, followed by completing the square to invert the transform. Uh, this, we're saying, is preferred. Uh, there's an example in your book of how to do that. Or you can use complex numbers and Euler's identity. A little bit harder to do, but there's the uh, reference in the Seaborg, Edgar, and Melchamp uh, book. Okay, also completing the square, just to remind you how to do that. Let's say you have an original equation uh, like this. What we're going to do is we're going to take a look at this, this middle term. We'll divide it, uh, divide it by 2. Okay, so that's going to equal 3. Um, and so we know it's going to be x plus 3 squared. Okay, because that's going to give us the uh, 6x there in the middle. And then it'll give us the 9. Uh, but we need to complete that. So uh, in order to get the 9 there, we're going to I'll just put the 7 on this side. And then I just need to add 9 to both sides of the equation so that it will factor to um, x plus 3 squared. Okay, so you just take this middle term, you divide it by 2, okay, and then that becomes the x plus that number that you computed. You square it, um, and the square of that, you'll add that to each side of the equation. Okay, and then we've completed the square um, right there, and, and then what you can do is um, you have, uh, you've completed the square, it tells you uh, your roots a little bit easier. Okay, so we have another example. We're going to find, uh, this is in partial fractions now. We're going to split these into into two pieces. We have uh, this uh, polynomial and then that part as well. So we have an unknown uh, alpha 1, alpha 2, and alpha 3. So this has to be 1 uh, uh, power less than denominator. Okay, let's say we had a repeated root in here as well. Let's say s plus 3 squared then we would need to have an alpha 4 over s plus 3 plus an alpha 5 over s plus 3 squared. So repeated roots are going to get uh, two entries here. Um, if you have uh, higher order polynomials, you just need to make sure you have a number of coefficients uh, in a polynomial that's one, uh, one order less than the denominator. OK, so I'm just going to go through this. Um, this should, uh, partial fraction expansion should just be uh, review. Um, and uh, we're going to just calculate these by, uh, in, in this case, um, you can use the, a couple different methods to do that. Okay. Um, and what we're going to do is just multiply over and then collect terms. Okay, so s plus 2 is on the left hand side. After I multiply over, and just collected uh, collected the terms. Okay, then I have my all of my s squares. I know there's no s squared here. Okay, so alpha one plus alpha two have to equal zero. Okay, and then I have a one right here, and that's in front of this one. So I know that four alpha one plus alpha three equals one. And then I also know that alpha Let's see, alpha 1 times 5 equals 2. Okay, so there I got my, um, my all of, I can solve for you know, these three equations now and be able to uh, compute my unknown alphas. Okay, um, okay, and then I have my partial fraction expansion. The reason why we want to do this is because we're going to be able to find uh, these kinds of terms in the Laplace tables that we may not have been able to find this term in the Laplace tables. Okay, so um, I'm just going to continue with this one because we didn't find, we don't have that one yet in the Laplace tables. Um, you know, how do we find it? Um, okay, so I can complete uh, the square here, like I showed. Um, and then I did find number 15 and number 14 in the Laplace tables. So I've got to get it into this form. And that form right there takes some rearrangement. This is just the math that does the rearrangement. 
uh, to get it into this S plus B form, um, where the S plus B has to be here as well. Um, for me, this isn't very intuitive, uh, but you know, it just takes a little bit of practice to work through and try to find uh, terms like this in the Laplace tables and then get your expression into that form with partial fractions or other methods. And then eventually you get down to uh, this in the time domain. And this, you can see it's going to oscillate. Okay, you have the sine and the cosine there, but it's also going to converge because you have this exponential decay. So this is eventually going to go to zero there. So it's going to steady out eventually at a value of two-fifths. Okay. Um, okay, so let's do one more practice problem. Okay, so um, I'm just going to complete the squares here and then uh, get my um, this back into uh, a form that I can find in the Laplace tables. And uh, there I have my solution, okay, in the time domain. So it oscillates and it diverges. You can see this is not a negative. It's actually a positive there. So that's going to go oscillate and then go to infinity. Okay, so what if the roots of the denominator are such? Um, okay, so this is going to tell us even if we have one positive, so that's going to diverge. Okay, but just to review, all of these are negative, but um, converge plus diverge still equals uh, diverge, okay? And then even if we have just one, um, this means it's going to oscillate, okay? One in the imaginary part, it's going to continue to oscillate, so it's going to diverge, and it's going to oscillate for this system. So I just want to show MATLAB um, really quickly, okay? So get back to uh, the MATLAB. Um, and just show you how to find the roots of a polynomial in, in MATLAB. So let's say I had something like, um, just while this is opening up, um, okay, let me come over here. Uh, let's say we had a polynomial that uh, looks like this, s squared plus 4s plus 5, okay, equals zero. Um, let's go ahead and implement that in, uh, in MATLAB and find the, uh, the roots of this. Okay, so there is our expression in MATLAB. Um, what I'm going to do is just type in the polynomial uh, coefficients and then I'll use the, uh, the root. Okay, so polynomial coefficients are going to be 1, 4, and 5 and then I'm going to find the root of that uh, polynomial. Actually, I guess it's poly. Okay, that is the poly. Uh, roots is the uh, expression. Okay, so there are my two roots uh, right there. I have a negative two for the real parts, and then I also have an imaginary part, so it's going to oscillate, but it's going to uh, converge.